So I'll invite Tamar to join me. And she should be here any moment now. Um, Tamar will be speaking to us about effective microservices in Node.js. I've already seen this talk. It's a great, great talk. Very informative. There's a lot of great content there. Uh, Tamar is a speaker that I've met a few times already. Uh, where was it? In uh, Munich last time, I believe, at International JavaScript, wasn't it? Yeah, I think so. Perfect. Um, yeah, Tamar is one of the greatest uh, Node.js speakers that I've heard. Very, very uh, knowledgeable about everything internal to Node.js. Um, and I'm very looking forward to this talk. So, oh, Tamar. I'm blushing. <laughs> Tamar, without further ado, I'll let you uh, take over control. I'll uh, hide myself in here. And uh, yeah, why don't you take it away? Um, cool. Um, so, I'm going to share my screen. Um, just a sec. Yay, I think we're good to go. Hi, everyone. I'm extremely, extremely, extremely excited to be here um, in this conference. So, uh, yeah, like a lot of crowd here. I've seen like a lot of people in the live chat. That's like a very exciting and like very um, makes me be, uh, you know, like very uh, excited about this chat that a lot of people have came. And I'm really honored to start the JavaScript uh, track um, in Dev Nation. And we are going to talk about effective microservices in Node.js. Um, but, um, well, first I'm going to start with like introducing myself because, you know, that's an obligation and that's what I always have to do. So my name is Tamar. Uh, well, I manage large development teams. I was an architect, but my uh, biggest passion is writing code, is definitely writing code. And um, well, I'm like specializing in Node.js. I've developed this specialization when I was a CTO of a start startup of my own. And I have wrote my entire backend in Node.js. Um, then I like really got to know the platform, and I got to know um, you know all the internals and all the new technologies. So yeah, it was a wonderful experience. Currently, actually, I manage the backend of a startup called XM Cyber. This is a really really cool startup. Um, what we're doing is like we're simulating hacker, a hacker that can like hack to your machines um, in your organization. And we're doing like really cool algorithms and uh, we're handling a lot of scale problem problems. And of course, everything is written in Node. Um, how can it be otherwise? Um, well, you can all just, um, you know, follow me on Twitter and other uh, stuff that I would like to say about myself. I have three kids, first of all. I'm a professional violin player, and I'm also a community leader in JavaScript Israel community. We have uh, several lineups of meetups. So if you happen to be in Israel after this corona stuff is going to be over, you're definitely welcome. But now we are going to talk about what we came to talk about, which is microservices in OJS. But first, we have to... Um, we have to talk about what are monolith or why people started with microservices in the first place. So what is a monolith? A monolith is an application. Um, usually it's like one huge code base with tons of components and um, you know everything is deployed together. Um, when you want to deploy the application, you deploy everything together. Usually everything is written in one language. Um, the build, you have one build process for the entire application, the entire deployment unit. Um, so actually that is a monolith. Well, I, I'm sure that all of you have seen this kind of architecture. Well, um, the traditional architecture of a monolith is, as you can see here, usually have a user interface. Um, it, doesn't have to be hosted in the server, it can be somewhere else. But you have usually also a REST API layer and a business logic layer, which talks to a data interface. Um, and the data interface is saving stuff into the DB. So I would like to tell you, you know, I have lots of bullets here, but I would like to tell you a story 
um, that happened to me about why monoliths are a pain in the ass. So once I worked in a company, and um, we had an NLP module, and that NLP module was not related to other components, but of course it was a monolith, and we had one build process. All right, okay. Uh, what was the problem with that NLP? The problem was that the developers who developed this module has broke it like twice a day. And they have entered the, like they, they pushed to the master stuff that broke the build twice a day. So because that everything, you know, was uh, like, um, you know, coupled into each other, um, because they like, um, uh, you know, pushed a lot of code that uh, broke the build, then everybody was not able to work. Imagine that I'm taking stuff from the master and everything is broken. So uh, yeah, that was like a really pain in the ass. That was one of the pains, but uh, you know, you're limited to one technology step, for example. If we're talking Node.js, you know Node.js doesn't really work well with let's say CPU intensive operations. Um, the build is usually one log. The, the build is usually very long, long, very, very long. Imagine that if you divide your build into like several short components, like short build times, and you know the build is very, very short. If you're building this huge thing, it can take like I don't know. I've seen it come up to 20 minutes. Um, deployment is very, very long. You usually have spaghetti code. Um, everything is coupled. It's really, really hard to maintain it. And yeah, as I just told you the story, when one thing breaks, everything breaks. So, you know, and this thing, just imagine that everything is on the cloud and on the same machine. And the same application is, you know, your instance is like serving everybody. What happened in this situation is usually you make your cloud machine larger and larger and larger and larger. And at the end, you get you, you end up with a monster. You have like, a, I don't know, more than Terra, um, Terra RAM memory. And you have like, I don't know, 500 CPUs and like crazy stuff like that. And imagine to you know to have a machine like that in this crazy size, and of course it happens like tons of money, tons of money. So in that case, we should just all think about microservices. So how does that make our life much better? So um, you know we have like many small models. Every model is responsible for one functionality. Um, well, usually every microservice has its own database, has its own schema. Um, well, usually those microservices are talking through protocols which are not related, related to technology. It's called technology agnostic. Um, they're talking with HTTP, are they talking with message queue? There is something that's called the API gateway. I will talk a little bit about it later. But that is like how microservices looks like. So they're small, they're lightweight, they're independent. I can deploy each one of them by myself alone. They're stateless usually. And so we're going from this monster that we have in the cloud and cause, uh, costing us lots of money into this. So we have like a lot of small racing cars we have a lot of small like machines in the cloud. Each one of them is hosting several instances of your services. Each one of them can host like different types of services. Um, you can deploy just part of them and not all of them. And um, yeah, that makes our life much, much, much easier. So um, let's talk a little bit about traditional microservice architecture that I usually see. So usually you have UI. The UI is talking with a component that is called API Gateway. The API Gateway is usually responsible for like routing um, the mess, the requests from uh, to the uh, like um, appropriate microservices. 
it is responsible for, um, um, you know, a lot of times like the login functionality is over there and throttling functionality um, to, you know, to overcome um, security like hackers that are trying to breach to your system. So that's what the API Gateway is doing. I didn't show it in this diagram, but usually those microservices are communicating also their like internal microservices. Imagine that you have microservices that are, um, well, they're in the front, they're getting requests from the UI, and you have microservices in the back that are not exposed to the external world and that are talking to one another with um, message queues. So after we spoke a little bit about the theory, um, let's start to think about what we need in order to build microservices in our Node.js. Let's say I'm starting from scratch. All right, I'm starting from scratch. I wanna, I wanna know which directions do I wanna go. Um, so what is it in our checklist? First of all, let's talk about frameworks. Um, which framework to choose in order to write my microservices? I'm gonna talk about Nest and I'm gonna talk about Express because these are, I think, the most two popular um, frameworks for uh, hosting, for building uh, web APIs and for building web servers in Node.js. I'm also familiar with other uh, nice stuff like uh, Sales.js and Koa and Happy, but I'm gonna concentrate on the, um, sorry guys, I loop back, but I'm gonna concentrate concentrate on the um, you know two most popular um, frameworks that there are on the market. I mean, if I'm gonna start from scratch, um, I don't know which one of them should I choose. Then I would like to talk about service character because imagine that you're writing a service that is doing a lot of IO or listening to a queue. That is um, different from writing a service that is doing a complex algorithm a machine learning algorithm, an algorithm in a graph. Um, those algorithms are usually CPU intensive. We'll talk a little bit about communication and at the end we'll talk about scale and how what is the best way to scale. So, um, yeah, building microservices with Nest or with Express. What do we want to choose? So let's imagine my microservices in that. What do I need? Well, usually I have a lot of databases. I have, I wanna, I wanna work with um, relational DB. Let's say a lot of times um, implementing authentication mechanisms is um, is is like much easier or comfortable to implement with um, relational DBs. And of course, I'm gonna need um, like NoSQL DBs. Um, for other functionalities, uh, maybe um, I would need Elasticsearch if I want to do quick text search, um, for example. So, first of all, I probably need a lot of databases. The other thing that I can say is that I also need like um, a lot of like message bus technologies. For example, right now in XM Cyber, we have. Uh, we're using the queuing mechanism of Redis. We're using the, the queuing mechanism of Rabbit and Queue, and we're using the queuing mechanism of Kafka. Each one of them is used for other other reasons, like other use cases. Each one of them is good for other use cases. So I can say for sure that I need to work with a lot of technologies. Um, I need a lot of databases. I need a lot of message passes. Also, I might want to implement complicated architecture patterns. Um, I don't know, like event sourcing. Event sourcing is a really, really, um, it's a really good pattern for scale um, if you want to implement it. So um, if, if I would like to implement architecture patterns, so um, I would probably want to like implement stuff like CQRS and event sourcing. And I need the ability to scale easily. So um, what do we have here? So we need a lot of technologies. We need complicated design patterns. Uh, BTW, um, if you're interested in event sourcing, this is a subject that is really good to study. 
I have a lecture about it. You're welcome to see it. But yeah, I'm talking about a lot of stuff and those stuff are, let's say, taking time to develop, to integrate with all these databases, to integrate with all these technologies, it takes time. And here I think is where the advantage of Nest um, really shines. Um, well, so what is Nest? Nest is a framework that was founded in 2018. It like exploded, really gained popularity. You, you, you're you you're, uh, writing in TypeScript over there and you have built in like also a uh, Jest testing. Um, it has, in, it is inspired, it is very much inspired from Angular, by the way. Nest is extremely ex inspired from Angular. It is like have a lot of components, have a service layer, um, have a controllers there. Each controller is talking to a service, a lot of dependency injection, uh, working with decorators. If you want to, I don't know, send HTTP requests, you have um, a dedicated component that is doing that. Everything is very, very, very structure, structured. It has a command line interface. Um, I would just, uh, I won't do a full demo. What I would like to show you an application. Actually, that application is cool. I mean, um, you're welcome to, I will publish the GitHub link in my Twitter account. Um, actually, this application, I wrote it for um, a security riddle. There is a way to, um, you know, to hack into the, the server without knowing any username and password. So if you're looking for a challenge, you can, um, you know, try it up. Um, well, what do I have here? Let's start from the beginning. So I, I don't know, let's look at app model. Yeah. App model is the file where you need to register your components. Those are controllers. Um, I don't know. Let's look at the login controllers. And we have services that are written here as providers. Um, yeah, let's look at the login controller. And here you would have a um, small example for how to write a post request. Um, you can see that controller is um, actually representing an HTTP request. Here is a post, you see. Here I indicate what is like the HTTP verb, whether it's a patch or a post or a put or a get or whatever. And here, that is the body, you see. Here is the body of the HTTP request. Um, I'm waiting for a service. Um, yeah, let's look at the image controller. Here you see the get, that is a get request. And um, here is how I represent the fact that I'm taking a parameter from the query string. For example, uh, how a service looks like, that is a login service. Um, actually, here there is nothing uh, like special about it. Um, it just, um, you know, it's transferred with uh, dependency injection mm -hmm. concept. Uh, well, uh, yeah, that's it. But um, actually, if you're into like a security riddle, there is um, there is a way to hack that server without knowing any username and password. So, um, what is good with Nest? So we've spoke about um, first of all, Nest had like a microservices model, and that model can be used for every microservice, which is like on the back. Um, you know, in the front, you're, you're going to write REST APIs like I've shown you with HTTP, usually, or you're going to work with WebSockets. But on the back, you're going to uh, might want to use this. So that is like, um, you know, that is like internal microservice that can communicate with other microservices. Here is a TCP communication. And, well, here is like a code, really small code snippet. Um, for Redis transporter, you know, here we have uh, like TCP transporter, look here. But, you know, if I'm just going to create a microservice and tell it to work with Redis, I can work with Redis queue, for example. So um, what I'm trying, yeah, and a RabbitMQ transporter. Um, of course, this is a RabbitMQ transporter. You see, it's really, really easy. So you're taking that, that code snippet. And you're just replacing that line in the transport, as you can see. Um, but what I'm trying to say 
is that you know you're working with lots of technologies and you have um, you know components to integrate with them easily. So you have built-in transporters um, to Redis, to Kafka, to RabbitMQ, to implement, like to work with gRPC protocol. Um, also, you can support complex design patterns out of the box. I mean, Nest has a CQRS module um, and possibility to implement event sourcing um, with multiple technologies. Um, so also that is like a huge advantage of Nest and it brings us to quicker development at the end. Like development is going to be quicker. Um, all right, so what's not going to work in that constellation or what's going to work like, um, I don't know, not that good? Well, I have to like share with you also stories about like the past. Um, well, what actually NestJS is giving us is an abstraction above the technology. Um, it gives us like a mapping. Um, so it gives us an abstraction and you're working with the abstraction. Let's take database. Um, let's take relational database, for example. Let's talk about relational database. In relational database, there are a lot of differences between inner join and left join, for example. In some cases, inner join are much more efficient. In much cases, in, in other cases, left join is much more efficient. So there are problems with, um, well, what's going on is that the ORM, the abstraction layer, is going to generate a queries um, in a way that it thinks that it should be generated. And then you're like gonna get a lot of queries. You're gonna get like very huge queries, very long queries, which are not optimized. And that is a big problem here. Or I don't know, for example, I worked with such abstractions that was doing lazy loading. What is lazy loading? It means that in runtime, just loading like a lot of objects into the memory. So yeah, just imagine that your program is running and then you're getting like something is starting to work extremely slowly. And yeah, that's exactly what's happening here. Or you know what, reading from a queue, you know that if you wanna read from a queue or write to a queue, it's better to do it in chunks I mean, don't like read one message and after that another message. It's better to read like two, 200 messages or 1,000 messages. It's better to read a chunk, for example, not to write it one by one. And when you're working with all those abstractions, um, so you don't, you, you're not familiar with the details of that technology. That is a problem. That is a big problem. Because if you wanna go to scale, you have to get familiar with the like little details of the technology. So actually, those are the benefits of Express. So it forces you to implement a lot of stuff. Um, but yeah, you have to get into the details of everything that you work with. And um, yeah, I don't think that you can like run away from this place if you're running if you're working with big scales. Um, so. That is what I want to say at the end. Um, you probably have to choose. Um, maybe at the beginning, it's good to start with Nest and then you know to uh, rewrite stuff that have to scale better. Um, that's what I have to say. So uh, now let's talk a little bit about CPU intensive algorithms. So um, what, what can be CPU intensive algorithm? Like machine learning code, um, for example, algorithms and graph. Um, well, I have to say that um, something is usually, um, well, when you work, okay, I'll start from the beginning. When you work with an API in Node.js, usually you have an asynchronous API and a synchronous API. Also, um, I, I just recommend always to use the asynchronous API and not the synchronous. Why? Because when you're using the asynchronous API, you're offloading your work to another component, which is called the worker thread pool. I think that all of you are familiar, I hope that all of you are familiar with Node.js architecture, where you have an event loop, when you have a worker thread pool, 
And well, in the event of you're offloading stuff to the worker thread pool, but if you're not offloading them, if you're doing them synchronously, your event loop is going to be frozen. Actually, Node.js has constant amount of threads. Think about it. You have the event loop thread, and you have another component, which is called a worker thread pool. So that gives us constant amount of threads. So if one of them is blocked, if the event loop is blocked, that is like the worst thing that you can do. Because then your server is frozen. If one of the worker thread pool is um, well blocked, that's also not good because you know you're not freeing it to do something else. But yeah, you have to like avoid a situation where your server is frozen. If you're working with a synchronous API, you're gonna cause the server to freeze and not to handle other work, and that is not so good. So the solution, if I have a microservices is doing that kind of thing. So I can go to other languages, let's say Python, for example. Python is very popular for working with machine learning algorithms, or I don't know, working, um, like working with other language, but you can use worker threads. What are worker threads? Worker threads came into the language and um, well, they became like not experimental in version 12, I think. And we're going from a situation where we have one event loop, one instance of libuv, and um, one instance of your code. Well, you still have one instance of your code and the hip space, but you have like event loop and like master event loop and slave event loops. And you have, um, well, isolated instances of libuv and v8. Um, actually, I would like to say that they are not threads. If, you're, if you have worked with uh, like in multi-threading environments, these are not threads. The concept is similar to web workers in the browser, if you're familiar with them. Um, how do they work? Well, usually you have a parent worker and you have um, a pointer from the parent worker to a child worker. And I hope you're familiar with the child process model in Node.js. If you're spawning processes, then you know those processes can communicate with messages. But here, also, like the master event loop can, can, can communicate with the workers with messages. The same, kind of the same as child processes. Let's see, how, let's see a little bit of code snippets. Um, well, um, yeah, this is the worker pool. This is actually the REST API. What I'm doing here, um, what I'm, I'm, well, actually recommending to do in order to implement worker threads efficiently is to work with a component that's called worker, worker pool, like thread pool, like a pool of workers. Um, actually, I have that component, um, but here on the REST API level, you can see that I'm talking to the pool, and I, I'm just like saying pool run task. Uh, this has like a constant amount of workers in, and it's choosing the, um, the available worker. And, um, oh, how did that happen? Um, I don't know, how does that happen? Um, but you would have to excuse me. Um, but yeah, that is the other slide. That is what's happened inside of a worker itself. But yeah, there is, um, I would like to recommend you to take the implementation. If you do work in worker threads in production, then you have to implement a pool. In this link in GitHub, I have a, a pool implementation, um, which is uh, like production ready. And it's worked very efficient. And you can take it from there. Also, this link is going to be in my Twitter later on. But yeah, that is like uh, gonna give you the implementation for working with this component like that. I think it's it's a very, very efficient. I won't say the most efficient, but it's it's gonna be very efficient, but it's it and it's also suitable for production. So yeah, you're welcome to uh, visit in my uh, in that GitHub account. I just didn't show it because it's it's long and I don't have time. Um, but yeah, so you can implement CPU intensive in Node.js. Just work with worker threads. Now let's go to our last section. 
Um, so um, let's talk about uh, how to scale in Node.js. Um, so I think we have two possibilities. One possibility is the child process model. Um, I hope that everybody here worked with like spawning processes in Node.js and are familiar with that API. Um, but yeah, I have to tell you that in the company that I work now, there are several old components that, you know, in the REST API level are working in such a way that they are opening actually uh, sub processes like slave processes and the master process is communicating with them via messages. When a request comes to the REST API, so the master process is also routing the request to the slave process. If you're, again, I'm hoping that everybody here is familiar with spawning processes in Node, but that is a mechanism. Um, and what's happening here is we have a master process and slave processes. Um, then I would like to talk about another deployment um, structure, which is working with Nginx. Um, that is an API gateway and wrapping your code in a Docker container. And then, you know, if you have a REST API, you're right, routing the code uh, into your several containers. Um, yeah, this is um, like the two deployments. The first one might be quicker because it's really easy to write that code. I would like to show you a load test, um, like the um, results of a load test that was done. Um, well, the the column of the cluster is the, the child process. Actually, the official name of the child process is the cluster model. Mm -hmm. um, IP tables would just, was just an API gateway that was um, based on Linux IP tables, mm -hmm. and Nginx was, um, you know, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. working with Nginx. And what's going on here is that you see that um, if we're working with child processes, you're um, processing less requests, actually much, much less. Why? Because your master process, here remember you have a master process, so your master process is also routing, is also transferring the requests from place to place and um, you know is responsible for this routing instead of doing actual work and that routing is not very efficient. So it is better to go with this. So let me summarize everything that we had here because it was quite a lot of information. I hope, you, I hope that you're not swamped. Um, but I think it would be better for, not better, I think it would be quicker to uh, develop in Nest and also have like built-in TypeScript and testing and everything. But um, when you're gonna get into large scale, you're gonna um, rewrite some of your code and like do a lot of optimizations do your queries to yourself, work um, more efficient with the queues. Um, also, for CPU intensive operation, if you're working with Node.js, work with worker thread pool, uh, work with worker threads, also create a pool. Um, take a look at the implementation that, that I've posted um, because it won't be efficient without a pool. And for production, when deploying it for production, and like um, dockerize your application, dockerize your service. Um, the child process model would give you good solution for POCs, mm -hmm. not good solution in production and performance scaling and like production through boot. So yeah, that was me. Um, Joel, really thank you very much for inviting me for Dev Nation. Um, and um, you're welcome to follow me on Twitter. Um, actually, I have to say that now with the online conferences, uh, I think that's um, like the biggest comp like the biggest like um, um, like a conference, like online conference that I've made. Um, yeah, we had over six thousand registered people, which is whoa. pretty amazing for uh, for an online event. I think so. It's pretty yeah, good. it's amazing. <laughs> wow! Thank you very much.
Thank you very much for being here. Uh, I did post your Twitter link on in the chat there. So if people want to know more, if you if you have any questions, feel free to ask them there. Thank you so much for being here. That was very informative. Uh, we're running out of time for questions, so I will redirect everyone in Slack. Tamar, I know it's getting late at your place. Will you be monitoring Slack for another five, 10 minutes maybe? Of course, sure. Okay, so if you have any questions, feel free to ask them either in the chat in Crowdcast here or in our Slack channel, uh, our link for <laughs> right in front of it. Slack channel is somewhere right there. So DN dev slash DN chat. Uh, you can follow us there. You will find the JavaScript dash sept 20 uh, channel in there. So feel free to ask any questions to Tamar or just uh, listen, uh, well, subscribe to her uh, Twitter and you will be able to follow her on Twitter and you'll be able to ask her questions there. With yeah. this, thank you so much. Uh,